welcome everybody to the to the third day of the workshop. Um, our priorities today are to determine what our research priorities will be for the next two years, both for the national projects as well as regional projects. We'll start with the national projects and work through in the same order as the rest of the workshop, from weed science to plant pathology to entomology. And then we will turn over the reins to the regional coordinators in the regional breakout sessions for each region to select two projects uh, for this coming year. Um, in the year in between uh, our workshops, there's the potential for shifting the regional priorities. So with that said, uh, we'll get started with Maddie, who will talk through the niceties for today's discussions. Maddie? Yeah, thanks, Christy. Um, so welcome, everyone. Good morning. Um, as we go through the workshop today, just a couple of housekeeping reminders. Um, we'll ask, a lot of you have done this, but it really helps if you could rename yourself in Zoom to reflect your first and last name and affiliation. You can do this by um, finding your name on the participants list, and then there's a um, button that says more, and you could drop down and click rename, and you should be able to type that. Um, we'll also ask that as you do come on and speak today, um, if you could introduce yourself to say, hi, this is Maddie from FountainWorks um, speaking. It just helps those who may not be seeing on the screen um, know who's talking. Um, you'll notice that by default, everyone's on mute. Um, this just helps minimize background noise and distractions. Um, of course, if you do have a question or comment, um, we want everyone to have a chance to speak. So we'll ask that you'll type Q into the chat as we've been doing the past couple of days. And that just helps us know the order in which um, people want to speak versus using the hand raising function. And then on the next slide. Um, today is the last day of the workshop, so we just want to make sure that everyone is mindful of the time. Um, we, again, want everyone to be able to speak and share their thoughts. So just using the Q um, convention will really help us have the opportunity to make sure folks aren't talking over one another. Um, Again, it's, it's okay if people disagree or have different comments and thoughts. We just ask you all to listen openly to one another, um, ask genuine questions, and of course, always being respectful. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Christy. Thanks, Maddie. So what we're gonna be doing today, as I said, is the final national priority and final regional priority setting. Um, so I'm gonna start with weed science. We'll just dive right in. Um, we've got goals for each of the disciplines. For weed science, two large high priority national projects or two slightly smaller uh, projects plus, or well, two moderately sized projects plus one smaller project. And in addition, potential for one of the two regional priorities in your region. So these are the weed science outcomes from the virtual sticker caucus last evening. And the top two projects were pre-emergent herbicide crop safety and post-emergent herbicide crop safety and efficacy. It just, when we translated things over to this morning, it didn't have the efficacy there. Um, I do want to make sure that I'm clear on what we discussed is the pre-emergent herbicide crop safety because it was very puzzling to me after some of the very dynamic conversations we had regarding uh, herbicides for in-ground propagation, uh, with most of them being pre-emergent, that that ended up being a zero, that nobody, not even anyone in the southern region, selected that as a potential project. So that seemed to be a, a little unusual in my mind. Um, so with that, uh, are there any comments about that from our southern region team? I'm not seeing anybody in the chat window who wants to comment on that right now. Um, but my perceptions from our conversations on Tuesday afternoon is that the pre-emergent safety project is specifically geared towards ornamental grasses, certain herbaceous perennials, and tropical crops. Is that correct?
Anthony, do you want to say anything else other than agreeing on my interpretation? So, hey, Anthony, uh, with your Penn State University. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, we did have lots of conversations and discussions about the propagation in fields and containers, but I think we came to the conclusion that there's just too many restrictions um, on the herbicides themselves that would really limit the number of products we could actually test. And so, and I think that was something we decided that was something we can tackle outside of IR4. Okay. That's why it probably wasn't a huge vote getter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks, Anthony. Um, and then the other one in the weed science area that is clearly number two is post-emergent herbicide crop safety and efficacy. But based on the notes I had from our conversations, it seemed like this was more geared toward finding uh, alternatives for perennial weeds um, or finding glyphosate alternatives for, for perennial weeds, looking at glufosinate um, and then combinations with glufosinate as a potential. Um, plus also um, Marone Biosciences raised, they've got three new bioherbicides that one or more of which may fit into this. So is my interpretation accurate for this, that it's more of an efficacy project, at least the first year? with maybe crop safety coming afterwards or somewhat in conjunction? No comments? Okay. Okay, so Joe, it looks like you've got two comments, one for the pre-emergent and one for the post. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I just put it in the chat. Uh, just, yeah, I think you were, uh, my rec recollection is the same as yours about the efficacy, uh, the efficacy of the post-emergent herbicides. The idea was we need alternatives uh, rather than safety. And the comment about the pre-crop uh, safety, um, tropical crops, uh, I mean, obviously that's very important to uh, the Florida growers. Uh, and possibly to some of the, the South Texas, Louisiana, California, I don't know. Uh, no one from other regions mentioned it, but um, you know, it's pretty specific to, uh, to the deep South, I would say. That's true, but we've done that before under these crop safety projects is to have some regionally driven plant materials as well. Yes, agree. So now the discussion is, does the weed science group want to focus solely on these two projects or do you want to make these a little bit smaller in terms of what we place out in during our research program and then add in uh, another project as a smaller one, similar to what we did during the past two year cycle. Christy, this is Mika. Can you explain what that would mean making them a smaller project? Because I, I did, we did have a lot of support for the pre-emergent herbicides for in-ground production. It, and no one really voted for that, but we did talk about that in our regional breakout meeting and specifically for bulbs and ornamental grasses. And, you know, maybe the woodies are too difficult with the product um, problems that you were mentioning, but bulbs and ornamental grasses in ground production was important. Okay. Well, that could potentially be a regional project. Um, but I'm looking at sedge and nut sedge efficacy as the potential third because that one was the clear third here. Um, what we did to, um, over the last two years is we had two projects that were very much geared towards crop safety. And then we added the NOSDOC project, which a very limited number of researchers could do 
but it impacted most of the regions. And so Nostock was considered a high priority national project. So that's what the third project. Um, potentially, um, we could have all of the funds going to weed science split between pre-emergent crop safety and post-emergent efficacy, or we could have slightly less going to each of those and then have three, two, three researchers working with sedge efficacy. Okay, so Joe, you've got um, a comment about Nostock and then Chris and then Andy. Oh, I just, you know, again, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, the Nostock. Well, I'm trying to encourage discussion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I just uh, wanted to remind everybody that, you know, the, the we discovered activity of finale this year. Uh, in the trials, and it looks very good. Uh, I think one year of data on that could uh, could finish off that project. Okay. Um, Mika, you you have a comment regarding that, and then we'll return to Chris. Yeah, yeah. Marcelo also would like to do another year of Nostock. So um, yeah, we would support that as the third smaller project if that's the way we go. Okay. Um, Chris. Yeah, I, I was I was going to agree with uh, with uh, Joe and what Mika uh, Marcella said. The no, another year of the nonstock, and another comment I had was with the post-emergence herbicide efficacy. And I'm sorry I missed the first um, probably. Um, 10 or so minutes of this. I was in another meeting, but for the post-emergence um, herbicide efficacy, would there be a way that we could include um, sedge species in some of that uh, where we're uh, also looking at um, the, um, the sedge and nut sedge efficacy? Um, so we have that, you know, as part of that post-emergence herbicide efficacy with the alternatives, et cetera, because that'd be an important group to see, you know, if we're getting the same control with those um, uh, alternative herbicides also. Okay. Well, I think we talked about perennial weeds, um, but we didn't define what that meant. Right. Yeah, that's, that was my recollection as well. So. Yeah. And nut sedge is definitely a perennial weed. <laughs> right. um, so we could, we could include some efficacy in there, but I think we will need to have some offline discussions about what this protocol looks like, because when you start talking sedge materials as well as, as typical broadleaf materials, it starts getting very large very quickly. So we'll need to have some discussions about what herbicides we include and what are the most important targets in year one versus year two. And we could end up rolling some of the sedge nut sedge in there. Okay, so Joe said he agrees with Chris. The post efficacy products we discussed include nut sedge. Um, Andy, I'll return to you just a second because Gary Chastagner reminded me that I didn't explain this slide well. Um, obviously, there's the regional, the regions there, and then um, the other one is not regionally aligned. We had folks from the international community present, mostly Canada. We also had folks that are national representatives that aren't tied to a specific region. Plus, we had our registrant community. We had one national, one international, and um, I don't remember exactly how many, about seven, eight of our registrants that participated in the sticker caucus also. So that not regionally aligned are all those three groups together. The total column, the 50, for example, the 57 represents the totals for the regions. And then the number in parentheses in the first line, 62, represents the addition of the not region, regionally aligned folks. The order of this slide, as well as the other outcomes, is in reverse order, top to bottom, 
for the regionally aligned folks. Okay. Um, Andy, you had a comment. Uh, hi, Christy. Um, I just wanted to um, second that the, uh, the discussion about uh, including the sedges in the efficacy part of the post-emergent protocol because uh, I think that's a, that's a, a needed uh, outcome in the next couple of years if we can get something some progress with, with sedges. Okay. So what I'm hearing is we've got the pre-emergent herbicide, we've got post-emergent efficacy, which some will be devoted to the sedge, nut sedge project, um, and potentially another broadleaf weed to be determined later. Um, and then smaller set of folks will continue to work on NOSDOC at least through 2022. Okay, so Joe Neal asked a question about the Western folks on post herbicide efficacy. There's clearly a higher ranking on this in that region, which is true. It is it's a lot higher from the West. I was just wondering what the, the focus of their discussions might have been, because uh, it, it may have just been different than, than the other regions we're discussing. So I, I'm curious what that focus might have been. If there are any Western wheat scientists on, I will let them speak. But we actually didn't talk about that in our regional outbreak, our breakout session. Yeah, I'm looking and I don't see Marcelo was on. It got 24 points, so somebody must have voted for it. <laughs> I think here in Colorado, we voted for that uh, area, but our top one was the pre-emergence herbicide crop safety. So there were two of us from Colorado that probably put that as our second choice. So that could have added up some points. I don't know where the other ones all came from. Okay. So Jim, what specific weeds were you focused on? Uh, if I recall correctly on post-emergence, we were even thinking of possibility of some sedges and even some liverworts uh, in that post-emergent area. So I think that fits into what some of the other discussion was earlier. I was late in coming on too, so I didn't hear all of that. Okay. Well, then, then let's go ahead and have pre these pre-emergent or pre-emergent and post-emergent be the top two, um, with the caveat sedge nut sedge would fit under that, um, and then Nostoc would be the third project. And I'm trying to find my uh, highlighter. Okay. So does that make sense? Okay. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, not next week because I need because I think we need a little time to decompress. But starting the second week of October, I think we'll need to get the weed scientist researchers discussing exactly what that protocol is going to look like, because we'll need to have that information um, into the portal for research selection by November first. So even if it's not fully um, put together, we need to le need to at least identify the specific target weeds that we're going to target. Okay. So with that, let's move on to the pathologists. Thank you, weed scientists.
Um, please stay on if, if you're not too bored. Um, uh, because I uh, do have a, a couple of cleanup things that want to make sure that you guys are involved in. So anyway, moving on to plant pathology. Um, here, uh, as in entomology, we do have standing crop safety project, and I did exp explain how this operates, operates in the session. Um, but right now, we're trying to target two high-priority national efficacy projects. And what came out in the voting um, is basically the same two projects we've essentially been working on over the past two years. Although in this case, um, Phytophthora and Pythium are, are grouped together again. So we need to talk through um, whether we have or include both again, or whether we really do just target Pythium like we did over the last two years. Um, and then the other high priority project, uh, according to the sticker caucus, is the non oomycete crown and root rot. And here we also should determine which of the four or five different root pathogens we should be targeting as a group um, so that our efforts are, um, so our efforts yield a, a more information for one or two pathogens so that it has a better impact on label development. Um, with that said, um, the North Central region had high uh, for botrytis as well as the bot canker. Um, and the Southern region also had bacterial efficacy as a fairly high project in the listings. And the Western region, um, Neither of the top two were their top, was the top two they voted for. Um, their top one was Botrytis. So I think there's going to be some interesting regional discussions uh, a little later today. Um, so with that, let's talk first about Phytophthora and Pythium. So for the plant pathology group, we talked heavily that Phytophthora was important for the woody production area primarily and pythium um, tended to be more for or some of the herbaceous materials in greenhouse. Uh, we do have products to continue testing for pythium. Uh, we don't have all the results yet from the past two years. Um, so it's still a bit of an open question, but how do we wanna move forward with this? Because the materials for Phytophthora and pythium may not be the same within the protocols. Dave Norman, I'm going to start calling on folks. Dave Norman, what do you think? Um, I wish uh, Mary Hausbeck was on here because she was promoting, you know, Pythium, more Pythium research. And a couple others on, on the call, call yesterday also promoted Phytophthora work. I was not that strong on either one of them, but if it's at, if it's at the top, maybe we should still go forward with it. Need some feedback from others that are on here. This, this is Tony from the North Central region. Mary is actually in a field of asparagus right now, and she said she just couldn't make it, but she does really want Pythium as her top choice still. So I can't really say much more than that, but she emphasized that to me this morning before she was out in a jungle of um, asparagus and weeds. So yeah, that's, that's what I have to say about that one. Okay, so... Um... Gary, it would be possible to have two protocols under one project. Yes, we've done that in the past um, when it's a broad project and yet the specific organisms underneath may have different regu regulatory pathways or registered products available for them. So it is possible to have multiple protocols. I just don't want to have too many different protocols floating around because it, it does add work into the system. Um, I, I think we've worked on some of the same actives for the past two years. We may end up having enough information on some of them to make some decisions about Pythium by the end of this year, but we've not really touched Phytophthora at all in probably three, four years at least, possibly longer.
Fulia, what are your thoughts? Fulia, um, if you're speaking, you're muted. Okay, so Stacy, go ahead. Uh, I was just mentioning that I know um, Phytophthora is something Inga is really interested in. Um, so I was just putting a vote in for that for her. Okay, thanks, Stacy. Um, Gary, do you have an opinion? Uh, I think they're both uh, potentially important and it depends on whether you're in a greenhouse or whether you're outside, uh, you know, uh, in a nursery, other type of nursery. So, uh, I think it would depend a lot on, uh, potentially what products, new products are available. Uh, since I do stuff on Vitophora, <laughs> my inclination <laughs> bias would be Vitophora. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, Within the registrant presentations, BW159 and SP2700 were listed for this area. We, are, we had both of those in the protocol from last year. In addition, we've got pick our butyrzox. Um, so we do have products to test in this area. Um, so we could just continue and you, and refine the Pythium protocol for Phytophthora, uh, given uh, assuming that it'll be outdoors with slightly larger plant material and probably different timings for collecting information. Um, Christine, go this, ahead. This is Janine. I, I don't know if I'll reflect this properly, but um, one, one uh, aspect we've discussed as a region is the need uh, to, to see how these um, act in different um, systems like uh, container versus field. Um, so I, 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 that could just be uh, one other thing to consider um, when doing these protocols or looking into uh, products we have to test uh, to uh, ways to expand the, the protocol. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in on that from the Southern region or if I'm, uh, capturing that correctly, but um, I think there, there certainly would be uh, things to test here. Okay. Um, Fulia, are you, do you wanna make any comments? Okay. Um, Jana, do you have any thoughts? about this? In my experience, we continue to have problems or growers continue to have problems managing Pythium. Uh, the problems we see with Phytophthora are generally people not managing and it developing as a problem and that the products that we've had to date for Phytophthora have been effective. So it isn't an issue of not having good products. It's an issue of growers not using them in a timely fashion as much. Um, I don't I, I don't know, for some reason, this kind of feels like a zero sum game and I don't want that to happen. Um, I think they, they are both problems, but I'm just, at least in my experience, Pythium just continues to, to be a problem that even with the products used properly, we're not getting very good control. Whereas with Phytophthora, with the products, it seems that when it's used appropriately, we don't have the issues that we do like we do with Pythium. Okay, thanks. So we, what we may end up doing is we may end up balancing a little bit between the two. Um, so we may do a little less Phytophthora research, a little bit more Pythium, but still touch both. Um, Rhonda, you had a comment? Um, yes, in just some earlier work I had done with Pythium, I found that growing media 
can impact whether or not you successfully can um, inoculate the plants with the pathogen. So I'm wondering if when writing the protocols for these studies, if um, the growing medium will be specified. We usually don't specify growing medium because growing media can vary across the country and growers utilize different um, media depending upon their operations. That just may explain why there may be some differences in the data uh, from one research, from one researcher to another um, because of the different growing media. Yeah, we do also request that that in type of information be included within the final report. So it might be possible to tease apart some of that as well. Okay, so moving on, um, non-oomycete crown and root rot efficacy. We've got four or five different pathogens we can test here. It would be good if we could narrow down to two of them. Muriothesium was raised as a major issue. Um, I, I think, therefore, we probably should move forward testing specifically for that pathogen. Of the other non-oomycete pathogens, which would be the best to target over the next two years? Um, Dana mentioned that Francesca was interested in rhizoctonia. We talked a lot about Fusarium in our region. Okay, and Dave said Fusarium. Um, you guys don't have to just be quiet. You can just put you in the comment and then I'll call on you so you can talk. <laughs> Gary? Uh, it seems to me that Fusarium rhizoctonia uh, would be the uh, at least the top ones uh, out here uh, in, in my area. We also have problems with uh, Scrotum rolfsii uh, and things, but certainly Fusarium and rhizoctonia are much more broad. Uh, okay. So I kind of said muriathesium. Um, should we pursue muriathesium? Mika? Sorry, I don't have a comment about that, but Michael Chamberlain mentioned in the Southwest that Texas root rot is a problem. Phymatotrichum, I, I'm not going to pronounce this right, omnivorium. Okay. Um, so Mika, I'm gonna to respond to you and then um, to Jana, uh, I'll move to Jana. My, my concern about looking at, or potentially looking at every single different one is that we won't be able to get sufficient data to have label impacts, even though they are important diseases. So, so that's a concern I have, which is why I wanna to try to narrow a little bit um, our focus. Um, Jana, go ahead. I was pretty much going to say what you just said there and just highlight the fact that um, in my experience, uh, myrothesium is more of an issue with growers in the, the southeast, particularly Florida. We don't see it quite so much up here in the Midwest. And uh, being a graduate from Texas A&M, uh, Texas root rot, phymatotricum, omnivorum, has had more bones thrown on the pile than any other plant pathogen I know of, but it is very limited to Texas and the, the arid Southwest, a little bit more out in New Mexico and Arizona. Um, definitely not a problem. We see it all in, uh, I believe, in other parts of the country, period. 
So Jana, um, which crops is it on? Thymatotricum? Yeah. Oh, that's the fungus that ate Texas, man. It eats everything. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not, I've seen it. I saw it wreck apple orchards down there. If it gets in, it's, it's epic. That it, it really, do, do a Google search or something and find some of the papers. It, it's impressive. It's got a, a cr incredible host range and uh, it's a very there, virulent pathogen. Okay, so there may be data that can be borrowed from the food crop area to add this disease to environmental horticulture labels. Absolutely, because it's a huge problem on apple crops, peach crops, pecans, uh, cotton. I mean, there's lots of, you know, any woody plant and maybe some annuals and perennials too. Okay. Kevin, um, you've got a comment, but then I've got a question for you. Um, is it seen in field container production in addition to field and ground? Um, no, most of the issues with, with what is commonly known as cotton root rot of Amatotrichiopsis somnivora has been in, in landscape, uh, primarily big issues when it's on trees. And so you got your elm trees, uh, a, a real susceptible to that, especially your lacy elm and a few other uh, trees. Uh, woody ornamentals in ground is, is where we see a lot of the problems, but also keep in mind that this is an alkaline loving uh, pathogen. So we see most of these problems. Um, you can pretty much draw a line, I-45 I and, and, and points west. In terms of chemical options, there is not a lot of chemical options available. I know at least on the cotton and as well as the grape site that we have been working on, uh, flutelanil has, uh, is, is being used and used successfully and has a label for it. So in terms of that, there's one option uh, that can be put, but in terms of, of nursery or, or pot, uh, woody ornamental, we don't have this issue, at least I've not heard of it. Okay. Well, Kevin, this is Meng Meng. Um, I think that's mainly, you said in ornamentals, you mean in ornamental, in, in containers, but in landscapes, uh, you know, in landscapes, that, that is an issue. Uh, yeah. Like that, that, west, west of uh, 35. So it's more a, it's more a soil born, uh, you know, uh, landscape issue because we okay. don't really have a whole lot of uh, in-ground uh, Ornamental can, uh, you know, ornamental production in ground, but but uh, Jenna is absolutely right. You know, like the grapes, and uh, you know, the grape industry. We have a lot of grape industry in the in west of um, uh, thirty five, and that's one big issue for for them. Uh, of course, that's not the you know grape is not the uh, you know the the topic. It's not the topic that we discuss here. Um, um, since it's. It sounds like more of a landscape issue for our industry. I, I want to remind folks, IR4 is more geared towards the growers than the landscapers. Whenever our data can benefit the landscape community, th that's wonderful, but we don't typically target issues for landscape. If, if um, So that might refine our discussions and which pathogens we look at as well. Jana, go ahead. I just put my comment in that from previous studies um, that the fungus was found as deep as six feet down. So as far as how you manage it in the landscape, yeah, I saw your eyes there, Christy. Um, okay. <laughs> Lida used to work on this. And, and actually when I was a new grad student, I went to him and asked to work on it. And he more or less told me that he wasn't gonna throw my bones on that pile. That's why I use that term. Um, okay. it, it, it's just, it's crazy. So, oh, Kevin just corrected me and said now 10 to 12 feet. It, it really, I've never seen anything like it. It's, it's okay. just devastating. And I feel for the growers who have to fight with it or the people who own land and everything else. But like you said, limited resources. Um, I, I prefer um, that that's a hill we'll all die on and the fungus will still be there. Okay, so with that said, even though I can't get everyone to agree on two, what we will do is Fusarium rux, Rhizoctonia, and Myriothesium under this protocol. Okay?
So um, Meng Meng had a comment about leaf spot. Um, on a personal note, it sounded like we had a lot of opportunities with new actives for leaf spot, but it was ranked at number six in the sticker caucus. So it's one of those things if um, there is a regional need for it, bring it up with the regional field coordinator discussions that will occur next. So with that, thank you very much for a wonderful discussion and some uh, new information on cotton root rot. I can't get my lips around that FIMO yet. So anyway, thank you everybody. And just like I told the weed scientists, please go ahead and stick around um, for the end. So similar to the pathology session for entomology, we are looking at two high priority national efficacy projects because we do have a standing crop safety project. Um, so with that, oops, hit the wrong slide. Okay, so, ooh, I should say 2021, not 2019. Do one. Okay. So with that, um, based on the sticker caucus, we have the same projects generally that we did um, in the last two years, scale and mealybug and boar and beetles. Um, scale and mealybug, uh, I heard a little bit yesterday that we may want to target some specific species under there. Um, for boar beetles, this is such a large area, we do probably need to refine which ones we're talking about. Are we continuing the foliar feeding beetles or is it a, another direction we wanna go this year? So with that, let's start with scale and mealybug. Um, are there some specific scale and mealybugs that you, okay, sorry, Mika. Um, you won't, Okay, at the end, I can go through and cycle through to show the weed science outcomes, if you'd like. Yes, thank you. Okay, I didn't realize that was just directed to me, sorry. <laughs> um, was that your question also, Mika? Yes. Okay. Um, and also, Mika, we're trying to get everything from these tables sent to you guys so that you have them for your regional breakouts. That's great, thank you. Okay, so with that, scale and mealybug, um, which species should we be targeting? Similar to the discussion we had with pathologists, let's see if we can narrow and not do um, lots of different scale and mealybugs, but let's see what we can do to target. Um, so Meng Meng, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, uh, Meng it's Mung Mung. So, so don't, don't let the E uh, fool you. Just just ignore that and replace E with the U, and then okay. you'll yes, and then you'll get my name hundred uh, percent perfect. Okay, I apologize for the many times I've mispronounced it. No, 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 no problem at all. Um, okay. Yeah, the reason that I want to um, mention about crate myrtle bark scale is because uh, it's not only um, affecting crate myrtles. And we have seen it on uh, American Beautyberry, uh, on uh, Spirea, on, um, oh gosh, what's the other thing that we are seeing? So right now, the, the only uh, really, really effective ones are the neonics. And, and we all know that, and, and our research has also shown that the residual, you know, will get to uh, pollen, you know, and you'll see those in pollen in large uh, concentration that's, that's, dangerous to bees. So we're really looking for alternatives that we could trade, we could treat these uh, plants without uh, damaging the, um, you know, the, the, the pollinators. Okay, thank you. Um, are there other scale species to be targeted? I know we've worked with crepe myrtle um, bark scale in the past, but it has been primarily on crepe myrtle. Go ahead, Dan. I would just say armored scales in general tend to be a tougher category. 
Um, Japanese maple scale is one that has been mentioned uh, in our discussion yesterday, and I think it would be a worthy goal. But if there are new actives um, that need the work, I think uh, if there is an, an armored scale in town that you could that someone could work on, I would argue in favor of that. It's sometimes we can't always choose. Um, we don't have a, a particular armored scale convenient to us, but in general, uh, some other options are really needed. Okay, thanks. It is nice to have dissenting opinions at times. <laughs> oh. JC, go ahead. Um, one species I, I, I would like to mention is the false orienter scale on Southern Magnolia, um, something that uh, Dave Hale at Auburn already mentioned in one of our regional meetings, and definitely something that's uh, pretty common in the South. Um, finding site should not be a problem. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> Dan, go ahead. Yes, just sorry. I wanted to also mention, I, yesterday during the discussion, I had said, you know, we might want to look at other kinds of scales, and uh, that was cut off. But th that's a, it was exactly the one I was thinking of is the um, crepe myrtle um, bark scale, which is a felt scale. It's not a soft scale. It's not an armor scale. It's a felt scale. Um, and we have some data on azalea bark scale related species, but um, I don't know how much there's on that particular one. Um, so might be good to have data on that species. Okay, thanks, Dan. Mika? Yeah, in our regional discussion, we discussed lobate lack scale is a big problem on ficus and hibiscus in Hawaii and root mealy bug in containers in Arizona and on succulents elsewhere in the West. It's also a common pest on turf, turf grass in Hawaii. And finally, scale on ornamental ficus leaves in Arizona. Is, it, is that a different one from Lobate Lac? Ah, that is a good question. I do not know. Okay. So in other words, it sounds like the group would prefer diversity in species rather than narrowing like I was suggesting. So um, that's the way we'll go. Um, and we'll try to balance between um, what gets done with mealybugs and, and what gets done with scale like we have in the past. Um, JC, you've got another comment? I, I was actually going to mention something similar to what you're saying, Christy, which is there's so many species out there and it's probably going to be different from region to region to region. Um, in the South, of course, I mentioned false or the oriented scale, but gloomy scales and other wax scales and striped mealybugs are starting to become a problem too. So, you know, there's a lot of options out there. Okay. Okay, thanks, JC. Um, boars and beetles. Um, let's transition to that project. What do we want to target here? So, Stacy? Top priority for me, redheaded flea beetles. It's the biggest, the, the biggest issue that we have, and the thing I get the most questions on. Okay. And that particular pest has been a challenge. Um, it, a, a number of researchers over the last four or five years have tried to get good data with it, and it's a challenge. Um, one year it's here, the next year it's not. Um, so it, it can be challenging to try to get good experiments with it. Um, it's always here in North Carolina, so. Um, <laughs> We, we wouldn't have a problem with that. <laughs> cool. JC. Yep, something uh, along the line as Stacy said, is like, it's always here. <laughs> we just have to be out there at the, at the right time just before they just before they emerge and apply the application before the damage showed up. And in that way, we can actually assess the damage a lot better. Um, but usually, though, if you have a nursery that have one or two years of infestation, you always have to. It's like they come in, they never leave. Okay. Thanks, Dan. 
Yeah, I mean, redheaded flea beetle continues to be a problem, I know, for us, and, and regionally, there's still some issues with it. I think we do have some materials we know that do work pretty well, at least to control it. I think part of the issue is timing also, maybe, and uh, residual activity, and there may be more than, than that to it. But um, I was particularly interested in um, whether lower rates of ISM um, 555 might be effective. That's one thing I don't, I, I think is worth exploring um, in addition to any other new products that um, have been discussed previously. Um, you know, higher rates of uh, tetracurb, for example, were mentioned or velifer. Um, so there might be, you know, things there that really would have value. Um, I know some of the growers I work with are really very reluctant to use pyrethroids or neonics. Uh, and we don't have access to Hachi Hachi on Long Island. Uh, that is effective. So we're recommending pyrethroids, uh, um, acetamiprid, um, and those are the probably the basis for our, our treatments here, at least here, where options are limited. And we also have two uh, products from Marone, MBI-203 and MBI-306, that have been in the protocols the last couple of years. Mm -hmm to take a look at the efficacy in, de in detail and come up with uh, suggestions, like you said, maybe look lower rates of ISM, higher rates of Velifer. Yes. And, and maybe um, work with the registrants to see how much higher we can go with some of these actives. Right. And so far, most of the information or, or the, the work we're doing is targeting adults, uh, probably because targeting larvae are such a difficult thing. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, that maybe remains on the table if something comes up that looks good as a systemic uh, or a drench kind of application. Um, so I, I wouldn't maybe necessarily rule that out. So in the protocol or any construct, uh, con some consideration to that may be, may be something worth looking at. Or if it works systemically for adults as well, that may be a, a third angle. Okay. Um, JC, then Mika. Well, it's, uh, it's kind of scary how Dan and I kind of see eye to eye, to eye on things. I don't know. Um, so at least, at least from my perspective, we do need some um, chemistry to new chemistry or new ray to actually look at for foliar protection. But definitely don't want to forget what is underground uh, in the pot as well. And uh, something that I mentioned during our regional breakout is that some of the work that she made and I are doing recently is basically showing that how, how much of the beetles actually come from the pot itself. So that's another area that we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Stacy mentioned, mentioned yesterday, if you want the growers to drench, drench the pot, it's almost like pulling teeth. But it would be at least good to get some preliminary data or some supporting data to say, hey, maybe we should think about different formulation for this AI um, moving forward. Okay. Thanks, JC. Mika? Yeah, in the Western region, Japanese beetle was mentioned as a problem on a, a large variety of herbaceous and woody ornamentals in Colorado. It's also a problem in Oregon. And the South American palm weevil has been spreading in San Diego in the landscape and likely to date palms. Of course, that is a food issue. And it has reached Orange County already. And then the Mediterranean bark beetles feeding on Mediterranean pines and native pines used in horticulture in Arizona. Oh, Michael Chamberlain is on. He can talk about that. Um, Janine, I, I see your comment. Uh, Michael, why don't you go next and then we'll return to Shamat. Yeah, I'll, I'll just reiterate that um, we have the issue with the bark beetles on cultivated pine trees. <clears throat> that, that includes both the Mediterranean pine borer and some native pine borers. Uh, also, we're concerned about the polyphagous shot hole borer, which is in California, and uh, worried about that arriving here. Okay. I think Keith has worked with the um, particular shot hole borer as well. Okay. 
So it, it sounds like we still have a need for the foliar feeding beetles, but also a protocol for the borers. Is that correct? I think so. Okay. And of course, we've lost chlorpyrifos. Um, a lot of the uh, bark sprays are, are pyrethroids, pretty much mm -hmm. mostly. Um, we're really, really limited on options, and it would be really good to have some alternatives, I think. Yeah, we may, with that one, we may or may not have enough tools to test, but what we can do is start pursuing a protocol um, and, and see what we may be able to find as options that are not yet registered to screen. You know, maybe ISM would work as a bark spray. That's, yeah. we might, we want to mm -hmm. rethink some of these things just as an idea, because uh, yeah. they'll need to have some residual activity, of course. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I just want to circle back to uh, redheaded fair beetle. Um, I, I know Stacy mentioned that uh, drench application may not be feasible, especially in bigger production. Um, but I think that uh, even in some uh, wholesale nurseries, they tend to use drench uh, as a strategy. They like that, especially to save some of the host, especially hydrangeas. You know, they they want to protect certain hosts from others. So I still feel that drench is definitely could be a you know there's a value in having a drench as an option. Okay. It, it was brought up yesterday that it's um, can be very expensive to drench as well as, as labor issues if someone doesn't have the irrigation lines to chemigate. Right, um, certain, certain situations, yes, yeah. they like to do that. Mm -hmm. So are there any other comments on these uh, particular outcomes? Um, I know Thrips was a very close third um, to second, and it looks like that has been driven by the Western region. So that it looks like that might be an opportunity for a Western region uh, project. Um, Mites was also raised uh, uh, as a strong fourth. Um, so with that, is there any other comments for entomology? Christy. This is JC. Yes. Go ahead, um, JC. In the South, we talk about looking at, you know, irrefined mites as far as the mites are concerned. So I was wondering what the Western region was thinking about as far as mites is concerned. Is it L mite or is it something else or another species of irrefined? I think um, if I'm remembering correctly, Michael Chamberlain, you can pipe in, but I think you were talking about the area of mites for aloe and other succulents. Yes, th th those are two that are of concern for me. And I think also that the aloe mites might be more widespread in the uh, commercial horticulture industry just because they are more popular as a container plant. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, I appreciate the, the wonderful discussions we've had on these projects. And um, it looks like we need to refine uh, the, uh, the entomology ones, particularly the boar beetles, a little bit over the next few weeks. Um, we'll need to find uh, whether we have enough potential materials to screen for boars, because that's a very unique type of application and uh, control strategy. Um, foliar feeding beetles will probably continue with the same type of protocol we've had now um, and include any additional materials that may be available. So with that, I, I really want to thank everyone involved in making this workshop run very smoothly. Um, to be honest, I was very hesitant <laughs> about an all virtual workshop um, because I've been so used to interacting with all of you face to face, but this has gone very, very well. And so I appreciate everybody that's been involved. 
um, from the regional field coordinators who have helped make sure that the discussions have gone well and remind me, oh, this person um, ha has something that they might want to say um, to the headquarters staff with all the preparations in advance. And we have a huge team uh, to make sure the workshops run well. And so I appreciate everybody that's contributed. In addition, we've had a wonderful outside agency with Fountain Works, both Maddie, um, Sam Cathcart, who hasn't been on, but he helped develop the sticker caucus. Um, and I know there's another lady that I believe Laura, who has been um, sitting in as well, just to make sure that there's no technical difficulties. So I appreciate everybody's efforts um, to have a phenomenal workshop this year. And I'm and I'm looking forward to two years from now where we can all be face to face again. Um, but with that, uh, I thank everybody involved in the program. It, I very much enjoy working with all of you from the researchers to the extension agents, to the, region, to the regional field coordinators, to the registrants, to the grower community and the trade representatives. This is just a phenomenal team um, to, to work with and to come up with great ideas for the grower community. Uh, I wanna highlight our sponsors for this year who have helped defray the costs associated with running even a virtual workshop. And with that, thank you all. I'm gonna turn it over briefly to Maddie. So for anyone who has not had a chance to be in breakouts yet on um, this meeting, she can run through how to do it. And then I'll have a final farewell to everybody. Thanks, Christy. Um, so in just a second, I'm gonna, or Christy, was it at 12.30? Are we taking a, a short break? Um, if the schedule says 12.30, we'll take a short break and dive into regional priority selection at 12.30. Okay, um, well, I can, I'll go ahead and open these breakout groups um, and folks can hop in if they want. Um, so we have four breakout groups for each of the four regions. Um, in a moment when I open them, you'll get a little notification and you should be able to join by either clicking the breakout rooms button on your Zoom toolbar. It looks like four windows. And if your window is somehow smaller, it might be um, you have to click on the three dots that says more and then there'll be an um, option that says breakout rooms. You'll just hover your cursor over the um, little blue text of the room you wanna join and then you should be able to join. Um, so with that, I, sh Chrissy, should I open them up or should I wait till 1230? Um, you can open them up, but let me in for my final farewell. That's good, thank you. <laughs> thank you all for a great workshop. Um, look for more communications from us, um, from Jen and the, the team at NC State um, on next steps. Um, our plan for this afternoon is the regional field coordinators will hold their breakout sessions until you guys have come to some consensus about two projects for your region. Um, and once that's done, um, they will email me and we'll pull it all together with Jen for a communication about final workshop results. Thank you all again. And like I said, I look forward to seeing you all in person, hopefully at a meeting soon. Have a wonderful afternoon, all.